Good evening. Welcome to the eighth chapter of One Book, One Minnesota, the statewide book club featuring William Kent Kruger, author of Iron Lake. The One Book, One Minnesota program is presented by the Minnesota Center for the Book in partnership with the State Library Service and sponsored by Spire Credit Union. I'm Elaine Hopkins, Director of Programs and Services for the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library, which is the Library of Congress designated Minnesota Center for the Book. As such, we present programming that reaches all corners of our state and promotes reading, libraries, and our state's literary legacy. The Minnesota Center for the Book is housed on Dakota land. This land was reserved by the Dakota in the Treaty of Traverse du Sioux, signed with the United States in 1851, and it remains sacred to them today. I also acknowledge the Ojibwe people, fellow indigenous inhabitants of this land. Dakota and Ojibwe people are also the original stewards of stories in this place now called Minnesota, and we at the Friends honor that tradition and the knowledge and values embedded in it as we work to lift up storytellers in our state today. Please take a look at the link in the chat to learn more about the Dakota people's relationship to Minnesota through the Bodote memory map, indigenous justice fact sheets, and the land back movement. I'd like to thank our partners, the Council of Regional Public Library Systems Administrators, Mackin VIA, Minitex, Minnesota Department of Education, Recorded Books, and Simon & Schuster. This program is made possible in part by the voters of Minnesota thanks to a legislative appropriation from the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund, as well as through a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts. Tonight's program has live captioning by Megan Stum through Veritext captioning. Since we created One Book, One Minnesota in April 2020, Minnesotans from nearly every county in our state have downloaded books by Minnesota writers more than 60,000 times. Today, we're thrilled to welcome attendees from all over the state and thank you for making this program such a success. The Friends offers programs like this to connect readers and writers across the state. We're grateful for the generosity of each writer who chooses to share their personal stories and we respect what they choose to share. We also appreciate our audience's desire to learn from writers and their experiences. The Friends is committed to building a culture that embraces diversity, equity, and inclusion. For our programming specifically, this means that we convene and lift up voices from all different backgrounds. We also work to ensure that our participants, both the writers and readers like you, feel accepted, valued, and celebrated. Thank you for choosing to spend your time with us this evening. We hope that even in this virtual setting, you feel part of this incredible Minnesota community. We're very glad you're here. So now I am truly honored to introduce our featured guests as Kent is joined in conversation with longtime friend and fellow Minnesota writing treasure, Ellen Hart. Ellen Hart is the author of over 30 crime novels in two different series, most recently In a Midnight Wood. She's a six-time winner of the Lambda Literary Award for Best Lesbian Mystery, a three-time winner of the Minnesota Book Award for Genre Fiction, a three-time winner of the Golden Crown Literary Award in several categories, a recipient of the Alice B. Medal, and was made an official GLBT literary saint at the Saints and Sinners Literary Festival in New Orleans in 2005. In 2010, Ellen received the GCLS Trailblazer Award for Lifetime Achievement in the Field of Lesbian Literature, in 2016, she was named a Grandmaster by the Mystery Writers of America. And now we have Kent Kruger. Raised in the Cascade Mountains of Oregon, William Kent Kruger briefly attended Stanford University before being kicked out for radical activities. After that, he logged timber, worked construction, tried his hand at freelance journalism, and eventually ended up researching child development at the University of Minnesota. Kent's work has received a number of awards, including the Minnesota Book Award, the Loft McKnight Fiction Award, the Anthony Award, the Barry Award, the Dillis Award, and the Friends of American Writers Prize. His last nine novels were all New York Times bestsellers. Ordinary Grace, his standalone novel published in 2013, received the Edgar Award given by the Mystery Writers of America in recognition for the best novel published that year. The companion novel, This Tenderland, was published in September 2019 and spent nearly six months on the New York Times bestseller list. Kent's latest book in the award-winning and acclaimed Cork O'Connor series uh, that began with Iron Lake is Fox Creek, due out next week. So, 
welcome to you both. Now it is, it is just my pleasure to be able to hand things over to Ellen Hart. Take it away, Ellen and Kent. All right. Elaine? Can you hear us? Good. All right. Um, I want to um, I want to thank uh, One Book Minnesota for um, th for including me in in uh, in this. Kent and I have been friends for many many years, um, and around the end of the 1990s, um, I got to meet him. Uh, I was teaching at the Loft Literary Center in Minneapolis, and I asked my students, I always ask my students, uh, to read a book, a first book, um, so that they could see where the bar was set. And I read Kent's book, Iron Lake. I was truly bl blown away. And I took the chance to see if he would come in and talk to the students, which he did. Um, and that's, that is how we first met. Right, Kent? <laughs> I, re I remember it well, Ellen. But, you know, that was actually not the first time we met. Oh, really? Oh, no. You don't even remember this, but I was in a writer support group, critique group, for many, many years, creme de la crime. Oh, yeah. And we invited you to talk to our group, and you generously accepted that invitation. You came and you talked to us, and you know, you said something to uh, all of us that I took to heart. You said, you can make a living at this. <laughs> Made all the difference in the world. Uh, Just you barely. Were... <laughs> <laughs> but I yeah. do remember coming to your class. Uh, it was the first time I'd ever been invited to uh, that kind of academic setting and just had a ball. And um, well, let me let me put a question to you. Sure. They had I mean, let's let's dive into Iron Lake and, and into your thinking about writing Iron Lake. They they loved the book, but they did not like something that you did in the book. And that was kill off a very important and a, and a very a character that we loved. Oh, she was the sweetest character in the whole book. She was. Why did you do that? Because because I'm heartless. You're mean. <laughs> so here's the deal. And this is what I explained to your students. Um, let me talk first about the death of Molly Nurmi, how that happened. Okay. So this was my first novel in the mystery genre. And I had done a lot of reading of mysteries. And one of the kind of one of the tropes of a mystery novel is that um, the protagonist's love interest is put in jeopardy. Uh, and it's up to the protagonist to save him or her. Um, so as I was writing Iron Lake, I knew Molly was going to be in danger, and uh, I just needed to come up with a way for Cork to save her. So I got to the point where Molly is in jeopardy. I'm writing every day at the St. Clair Broiler, 6 o'clock every morning. Right. I'm going there morning after morning now, trying to write this scene where Quark saves Molly, and it's just not happening. And finally, I sat back, uh, Ellen, and I asked myself, is that because Quark doesn't save her? Mm -hmm. And uh, I went to the, the broiler the next day, and I, I said to myself, I'm going to write this scene. However it plays out is, is the way it's supposed to be. And I wrote the scene in which Molly dies on the ice. Now, while I was writing that scene, the, the, the waitress who always poured me my coffee came and she put her hand on my shoulder and she said, Kent, are you OK? Because there were tears yeah, sure. <laughs> streaming down my cheek. It hurt to kill Molly. But it did so much for that book and so much for the series. And here's what it did. Killing Molly made that book more than just a beach read. Yeah. Because readers, if I'd done my job correctly, were emotionally invested in Molly, and her death had an emotional impact on them that a beach read doesn't. Sure. Um, it also motivated Cork to go through the rest of the book and do what he had to do uh, in order to, um, you know, fix the situation. But here is what happened in the long run. Readers who... Um, you know, if when you have a central protagonist at the heart of the series, you don't get a lot of distance when you put that that character in jeopardy because the astute reader knows that you're going to pull his or her ass out of the fire at some point. That that character has to be in the next novel. 
But readers who have read Iron Lake and know that I killed Molly understand that although Cork is safe, anybody else I put in jeopardy might not make it to the end of the book. And that's where the, the real suspense comes from. So it just uh, helped help me establish in yeah. a reader's mind that they can't predict what I'm going to do. You know, you know you, you I said can be heartless my, if I have to. Yeah, you said that to my class. And I just thought that was brilliant. Because that's so true. You can't, if you put your main character in jeopardy, you know that yeah. if you want to have a career, you're not going to, that person's yeah. going to be fine. But yeah, I thought that was brilliant. Why mysteries? Why did you choose a mystery? You know, I've been trying to write the great American novel for a very long time, not to, uh, with no success whatsoever. Okay. <laughs> and then I went through a midlife crisis and, um, and thought the hell with uh, writing a great American novel. I want to write something somebody might actually want to read. So I looked around Ellen to see what people read. You know what everybody reads. Everybody <laughs> reads mysteries. It's right. a a genre whose appeal cuts across all socioeconomic, ethnic, um, gender, age uh, levels. And so I thought, I'm, I'm going to write a mystery. Um, you know, what did I know about mysteries? Uh, here's a confession coming from a mystery writer. Before I wrote mysteries, uh, I didn't read them. <laughs> Seriously. And my father was a high school English teacher, and he had convinced me that mysteries were the poor stepchildren of literature. So I didn't even read Nancy Drew or the Hardy Boys when I was growing up. Um, so I had a lot to learn uh, uh, about writing mysteries. But once I, I began to write them, um, I, I really enjoyed the process. I like the fact that in mysteries, and you, you know, when we have talked mysteries, you have pointed this out to me many times. In a mystery, there is a clear beginning, and there's a clear middle, and there's a clear ending. And so much, uh, particularly modern literature, doesn't really give you that satisfying story arc. And I love that about mysteries. And here's something else. Here's, here's something that Ellen taught me early on about mysteries. People think mysteries are formulaic, but that's not true. There is no formula to mysteries, but there is a structure. And it's a very, it's a very loose structure um, but, uh, but really solid in terms of what you want to accomplish and really flexible. Here's the, as you told me, Ellen, here's the structure of a mystery. A mystery begins with something happening, investigation follows, and answers are found. Very simple. Something happens, investigation follows. Well, you know, something happens, it's usually a murder, uh, a crime, very often a murder investigation follows and answers are found. Very simple. And I love that structure. I found that within that, that simple structure, I can do anything I want to as a writer. I can write any kind of novel I want to write, so long as I'm true to that structure. That's right. That's so true. Um, I mean, a mystery novel, in a sense, you come upon a world in chaos. And you know that by the end of that book, you're going to have answers. I think that's comforting especially in a world where we don't have a lot of answers. Oh, here, here. And I think that's what makes them continue to be popular. That's maybe that's part of the formula or part of the structure, but I think it's extremely, it's extremely popular. Do you know, I think that's an expert. I don't think it's because I said there's no formula, uh, but I think it's part of the expectation uh, yes. a reader has that at the end of this story, the world will be set right. Um, good will have triumphed and uh, and we can feel, sit back and feel safe and comfortable. Now, I haven't always done that in my books. No, you have I'm not. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I like to monkey with the structure. What can I say? Uh, but uh, but I, I do. That's one of the reasons I love mysteries. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think modern mysteries, um, they don't always end happily, at least for everyone in the book. And I think that's perfectly, I mean, I, I still love those mysteries. Um, and I also think that mysteries, I mean, you know, there, there used to be things like um, breaking the law is bad, um, doing these things are evil, a more contemporary, and I'm not sure I like this, but, you know, that breaking the law is okay, and, you, and, and evil is good, and it's good to be bad, and that kind of thing. I've seen that in mystery novels, too. So, you don't always get this perfect ending where everything, you know, and I think people who read, say, traditional mysteries are looking for that. But people who read 
um, perhaps more complex mysteries they're looking are, are okay with ambiguity. And I think that's important. You know, I typically write uh, stories in which um, uh, Cork's ethos is front and center. He's a guy who's, you know, he, he's just a regular guy. He's always trying to do the right thing. He's always trying, seeking justice. Doesn't always get there. Doesn't always make the right decisions, but he's really trying. But I have in a couple of my novels had Cork cross the line um, and leave uh, um, justice essentially behind yeah. because there were compelling reasons to do that. And I do have to admit that I like mysteries that have uh, some moral complexity to them. You yeah. have to ask yourself, in this situation, what would I do? What would really be right here? Right. I, I, one of the books that I wrote, I think at the end, I think my main character let the bad person go. Yeah. I guess I've done that. I've done that. I know. I know you have. <laughs> I got some blowback on that, but you know, you can go all the way back to Sherlock Holmes, where Sherlock Holmes at, in one of the stories decided, um, we're going to have a little trial here and I'm going to be the judge. And they did this little mock trial and he decided, I'm not going to do anything with you and let the guy go. So, I mean, we have antecedents um, for that. Well, I have had some of my characters, I think I must have said this two or three times out of various characters mouths. Um, the right thing isn't necessarily always about what, justice isn't always necessarily about the law. Right. Very well put. Very well put. OK, um, for readers out there who have not heard you speak, I think one of the most interesting stories that you tell is how you got published. <laughs> how I published um, Iron Lake. <laughs> yeah, how you published Iron Lake. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, thanks, Ellen. I love this story. I love telling this story. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great story. Yeah. So, you know, when we, uh, for those of you who don't know this, uh, Ellen and I traveled for years and years and years, probably a dozen years together yeah. with uh, another mystery author here in Minnesota, a guy named Carl Brookins. We called ourselves um, the Minnesota Crime Wave. And we appeared in libraries and bookstores. And, you know, we did national tours. We had a we had a television show for a while. We had fun. Uh, oh, <laughs> did, did we ever have fun? Did we ever have fun? And this was a story that I, you heard me tell many times when we did events. Um, so here it is. So um, so I'm part of a mystery writer support group for many years. Uh, we called ourselves Creme de la Crime. And, uh, and when I was uh, writing the manuscript for Iron Lake, I was giving uh, it to my uh, colleagues in that uh, group to, to read and critique. And when we thought we had the manuscript in the best shape we could po all possibly get it, um, I did what you were supposed to do back then. This was mid 1990s. I qu sent query letters to 36 New York uh, literary agents, New York, heart of the publishing business. I got six responses. All of them said, no, thank you very much. And um, and these were form letters and the, the level of uninterest in my work was clearly communicated to me <laughs> because these were Xeroxed form letters and two of them had been Xeroxed crooked on the page. Oh. So I know, I know. So about that same point in time, a couple of my friends in the, uh, in, uh, the writers group went to a conference in Chicago and when they came back, they, a writers conference, and when they came back, they said, we have your agent. The keynote speaker that year was a woman named Jane Jordan Brown, who had a literary agency in Chicago. And, uh, and her keynote speech was, how do you get an agent? My friends brought me back a tape of her talk. And when I listened to that talk, what I realized was that Jane wasn't t telling these, uh, these writers, um, this is how you get just any old agent. She was saying to them, this is how you get me. Jane Jordan Brown is your agent. And when I listened really carefully, it seemed to them, seemed to me that what, what Jane was suggesting to them was, if you want me, Jane Jordan Brown is your agent, you need to say something very nice about me in your query letter. <laughs> so, uh, so I spent a couple of weeks coming up with a great, uh, great compliment to open my letter to Jane. I sent it to her and two weeks later, I got a call from her saying she wanted to see my manuscript. I sent it off to her and six months, uh, six weeks later, uh, she got back to me. She, and that six weeks, that's a pretty fast turnaround time. That's a sign of a good agent. But she said, I'm not going to represent you. Your manuscript is too long. It was 500 pages. She said, I can't sell a first novel this long, but if you're going to, if you're willing to cut it by hundred pages, I'll take a look at it again. hundred pages, Ellen. That was like asking me to cut off my right arm, but if that's what it was going to take, that's what I was going to do. So I reeled it back in and over the course of the next year, I actually cut it by 120 pages. I sent it back to Jane. She said, this is exactly what I was looking for. I will represent you. Let's go. She sent that manuscript in November of that particular year 
to six of the large, largest New York publishing houses with this very bold demand. Do you want to publish Kent's novel? Give us an answer by Christmas. Now, what I didn't know about the publishing business is that nothing happens at Christmas. For two weeks before Christmas and two weeks after Christmas, they all leave the city. They go to New York City. They go to the Poconos or Berkshires or Florida, wherever they go for vacation. And the publishing business kind of grinds to a halt. So Christmas rolls around. We haven't heard anything. New Year's rolls around. We still haven't heard anything. I still remember this really bleak night in the middle of January. I'm sitting at the kitchen table. My wife, Diane, is at my side trying to console me. I've got my head in my hands and I'm whining something like, nobody wants my book. Nobody wants my book. But I get a call from Jane the next day or maybe a couple of days later saying, somebody wants your book. She explained that it was an offer from St. Martin's Press. Uh, you, uh, that's your press, uh, one of the fine mystery imprints in New York City. Uh, she said, it's first author contract, not a lot of money, but somebody wants your book. I said, wonderful, Jane, where, where can I sign? And she said, you're not going to sign because I think you're going to get another offer. The next day we got a, an offer from Simon and & Schuster and it was a much better offer. And I said, wonderful, Jane, where do I sign? And she said, you're not going to sign because uh, I, uh, I have uh, told St. Martin's about Simon and Schuster's offer. I think they'll make a counter offer. And the next day we got a counter offer from St. Martin's. They said, not only will we give them more money for Iron Lake, we know is it work on a second novel, we'll buy that one too. I said, wonderful, Jane, where do I sign? And she said, you're not going to sign because I called Simon and Schuster and told them about St. Martin's uh, offer. I think they'll make a counter offer. And the next day we got a two book counter offer from uh, Simon and Schuster that was so lucrative. I it could, it couldn't turn it down. It, it, so here's something, Pat. Here's something, Ellen. <laughs> um, I love talking. I love telling that story to um, young writers um, because one of the things I try to, to communicate to them is one of the things that it means to be a writer is to live in hope. You always have to live in hope. And, and what I pointed out to him is, I believe that because I lived in hope and I had one of my deepest dreams come true. Yeah. A big war broke out for my first book. Yeah. Live in hope. You know, um, I think people need to know also that that wasn't the first book you wrote. You put in your time. I mean, you didn't just, this book didn't just appear poof out of nothing you worked hard to become the writer that could publish uh, could could write a book like iron lake and i think that's an important thing to know too it, it i think sometimes um young writers get ahead of themselves they think oh gosh i can't get a new york press so i'll publish it myself you can certainly do that um there are a lot of boutique presses that are that are as as certainly as good as as publishing through new york but I think you need to put in your time. And that's something you did. Yeah, you know, I served a very long apprenticeship. I have, I have always wanted to be a writer. I have always written, but I didn't publish Iron Lake until I was 48 years old. Yeah. So, uh, so you know, I just tell, tell, try to tell writers, be patient. Well, when the time is right, it will happen for you. You know, there are a number of people who want to know what your radical activities were. <laughs> 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 okay, here's, uh, you know, I'm willing to, I, it's, it's another story that I enjoy telling. Um, shall I do that? Shall I take a little bit of time? Absolutely. So I was at Stanford University. I matriculated in the fall of 1969. This was deep in the Vietnam War. Um, and for those of you who are old enough to remember, you may remember that the spring of 1970 was the spring uh, in which the shootings on the Kent State campus took place. Uh, it was when we learned that not only were we carrying on a war in Vietnam, we were also carrying on a secret war in Cambodia and in Laos. Um, Stanford University had a, a relationship at that point in time with an organization, uh, a business called SRI, Stanford Research Institute, whose primary source of income, at least that, at that point in time, was research in, into military weaponry. Uh, there were a lot of us at Stanford that felt that that was an inappropriate relationship for um, an institution like Stanford to maintain, particularly at that point in history. And so we, uh, we petitioned the Board of Trustees to sever the relationship. We petitioned the administration. We marched, we demonstrated, and nobody listened to us because, of course, there were enormous sums of money involved. So finally, in frustration, a group of us uh, one day walked into the administration building and occupied it. 
Uh, the president of the university, a guy named Richard Lyman, said, fine. He was very reasonable. He said, fine, I'm not going to give you, you any problem. He vacated the building and we took it over. That night we had a dance uh, where... Um, uh, typically, uh, students would have registered for the classes in the building, and uh, we had a band come in. Uh, and about midnight, the band packed up and took off, and those of us who were going to occupy the building rolled out our sleeping bags and went to sleep. Huge tactical error. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, at 1 a.m., the Palo Alto riot squad swept through and arrested us all. I was on a full scholarship. Uh, the scholarship evaporated and I had to leave Stanford. So that's wow. my story. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm also looking at the questions here because I do want to I want to get to some of those. There are a lot of questions about why you chose to make uh, Cork half Native American. Uh, is it half Native American? It's actually one quarter. Native. One quarter Native American. Yeah. OK, I thought I was wrong. Um, so why the Ojibwe element? Sure. You know, um, when I decided that one of the very early decisions I made about what I was going to write was that I was going to set my work up north sure. in, the, in the just the beautiful great north woods, the Arrowhead, really, um, because I, I'm not native to Minnesota, but shortly after we moved here, um, we began, you know, doing what everybody does in the summer in the Twin Cities. We started vacationing up north. We began sp spending a portion of every summer at a YMCA camp north of Ely, a place called Camp de Nord, which is literally across the road from the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness. And when I saw that marvelous country, I knew that's what I wanted to write about. When I took a really good look at the North Country, I realized you can't write a true story set in the North Country without including uh, the Anishinaabe. Uh, people as uh, as a uh, an element of the work because their influence up there is ubiquitous. It's everywhere and it's powerful. So I decided I was going to include the Ojibwe in what I wrote. Um, now you know, here you go, um, fiction writing 101. You know that what every fiction writer is looking for is conflict. It's conflict that drives great stories. Uh, what is it that drives um, uh, Romeo and Juliet? It's the conflict between the Montagues and the Capulets, those two powerful families in which our star-crossed lovers find themselves caught. Moby Dick, Ahab and that white whale, conflict, conflict, conflict. So when I looked up north, that's what I saw was conflict. Conflict in, uh, in that rugged landscape, conflict in the weather, conflict in the cultures, particularly who were trying to live together up there and often not doing a good job of it. So I thought, what if I created a character who in who he was could mirror the conflict of those two cultures, white and native. Okay. So I decided I was going to make Cork um, uh, part native. Well, that makes sense. Um, did Hillerman enter in, you know, was he at all instrumental in what you were doing or did you not, did you read Tony Hillerman? Yeah, I did. You know, when, when I decided I was going to, uh, to write mysteries instead of the great American novel, uh, and uh, had to uh, really had to bone up on mysteries. What does it take to write a mystery? I discovered Tony Hillerman's work very early on and just, was just amazed at how flawlessly, seamlessly, he was able to weave the that interesting cultural information about the Navajo, the Diné, into his stories. And, you know, I knew nobody was doing that uh, at that point in time, at any rate, uh, with Ojibwe here in Minnesota. And so that certainly influenced my decision. Okay. All right. And and how did you go about doing your research for that? Yeah, well, uh, you know, I was a cultural anthropology and ma uh, uh, anthropology major in college. And so the idea of learning about the Ojibwe culture, about which I really knew absolutely nothing, like most white people at that point in time. Um, uh, but the idea of learning about this culture, not my own, was really exciting to me. And I began, you know, in the way all academics began, I began by reading. I read everything I could get my hands on about the Ojibwe people, the early ethnographies. I read the, the Shinab storytellers. I read books about Ojibwe myth and Ojibwe ritual. And when I thought I had a pretty good handle on the Ojibwe culture, I began to, to write the book. Now, during that research, uh, I began to, to meet... Um, folks in the Ojibwe community and form relationships that have over the years become important friendships. Um, and so that's how we began. Uh, I, I try to keep track of what's important in Indian country. Um, I, I rely on my friends in the Ojibwe community to help guide me, to tell me about important issues that I might want to include in my work. 
Um, and whenever deadlines allow, I give my manuscripts to at least one, but usually two of my Ojibwe friends to read and vet so that I haven't said anything that's too stupid or, or even worse offensive. Um, okay, that, that's fascinating. It's always been fascinating to me how you, how you went about that. But let me, let me talk about this now. You said you, you wrote a mystery because you were sick of trying to write the great American novel, but then you have now... I think, gone on to write the great American novel. I mean, uh, Ordinary Grace in this tender land. Why did, why did you change? I mean, you're still writing the Cork O'Connor books. But why did you change pace like that? Why did you write a standalone? Do you know, and you know this because you write a long running series. There are advantages and disadvantages to a long running series. The advantage um, you're working with familiar territory, you've already established your characters, your, uh, your setting, uh, you already have offered the reader elements they know will be in each of your books. And of course, publishers love the fact that every new book in the series sells the backlist. Right. Pitfalls. One of the major pitfalls of uh, writing a series is, is that readers aren't necessarily going to want to follow you to a place that doesn't include your your um, uh, protagonist. And I, I experienced that with really my very first standalone book called This Tender, or called uh, The Devil's Bed. Uh, three people in the entire universe read The Devil's Bed. No. <laughs> <laughs> because Cork O'Connor wasn't in it. Um, and you, the other big problem is, is that you are limited then by readers' expectations and by the, the demands of the genre in terms of what you can do. You know, if you want to grow as a writer, you have to push the boundaries. You always have to be testing yourself. And I had other stories that I wanted to write. And finally, uh, finally, the idea and how to tell the story for Ordinary Grace uh, just loomed so large in my, in my imagination, I couldn't ignore it. And I wrote Ordinary Grace, uh, which broke me out to a much larger audience than my mysteries and allowed me the freedom to write then this tender land. Yeah. Okay. I'm just curious about, um, has Hollywood come calling for any of these? <laughs> yeah, I get this question a lot. I've been, you, I'm sure you have too, been dealing with Hollywood all of the, from the very beginning. When yeah. Ireland came out, I got a call from a Hollywood, Boundary Waters came out, got a call from a Hollywood. My, my Cork O'Connor novels have all been optioned for uh, one of the screens, big and small. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, you know, Hollywood is such a bizarre place it's, and it takes an enormous amount of everything falling exactly into place at the right time for that to happen. Hasn't happened for the Cork O'Connor series yet. So there's nothing, um, there, there's nothing pending. I, I have uh, a screenplay is being written for Ordinary Grace uh, oh, good. Yeah, as a multi-part uh, series for one of the streaming platforms. But again, don't hold your breath. And we've been dealing with, uh, I think, four different production companies at this point in terms of the rights for this tender land. But, you know, here's the deal, Ellen. I don't want some fly by night, yeah. you know, Hollywood know nothing to handle my work. I want it to be done respectfully and, and the heart maintained. And so if nobody ever, you know, puts my book on one of the screens. I don't care. I yeah. really, that's not a big issue for me now. Well, you know, I mean, like Sue Grafton, she had worked in yeah. Hollywood and would not allow Hollywood yeah. to touch your books. Yeah. And um, then Sarah Paretsky, obviously they did a, 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 a horrible a, a treatment. Mash, yeah. 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 She asked her, they said, does that make you feel bad that the that the movie did not do well? And she said, well, no, because I didn't do anything. You know, that that was a character, but my books are over there on the shelf and yeah. they're doing fine things. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Do you know, I have known very few colleagues whose work has been uh, put on the, the bigger or small screen who've been happy with what what the outcome was. Yeah. Um, I When we, used, we were traveling together, I read a book about Hollywood and... <laughs> The title of the book was "Hello, He Lied." Yeah, <laughs> I get that. Flavor. Yeah, it's a great book. Um, be before we um, move on to uh, more questions from the audience, I want to give you a chance to talk a little bit about um, your newest book that'll be out next week, and to perhaps read a small 
something from either that or Iron Lake? Yeah, you know, I'm going to read a little bit of Iron Lake. Okay. And and that I'm going to use that as a segue to talk about Fox Creek. Good. Um, Fox Creek, <laughs> the next book in the series, comes out um, the 23rd. I'm going to read uh, from uh, a, a very short section from the beginning of the book. And just let me set this up a little bit. Um, this in this section we meet Henry Malou for the first time in the across the course of the entire series. Cork meets him after we meet Cork in this story in the worst place in his life. He is so low. His marriage is on the rocks. He's afraid he's going to lose his family. He's already lost his job as sheriff. He's lost his self-respect. And the most, the brightest point in his life uh, right now is a woman named Molly Nurmi, with whom he's having a relationship, uh, an affair. Uh, and uh, in the section I'm going to read, Cork O'Connor has just left a tryst with Molly, and he's driving into a terrible snowstorm and we meet Malou. Okay. The state highway was no better than the county road through the woods from Molly's. Except for the Bronco, not a thing moved in the white hillocks the wind had bulldozed across the asphalt. From the weather reports he'd heard, Cork was pretty sure it was like that from the Canadian border all the way across the arrowhead of Minnesota into Wisconsin. He drove slowly, steadily, a little blindly, after 20 minutes, he came on a figure hunched in a red plaid mackinaw and wading toward town. He slowed to a full stop, stepped out onto the running board, and hollered, get in. The figure, so bundled Cork couldn't even see a face, slowly turned and came toward the Bronco. When they were both safely inside, Cork started once again for Aurora. Hell of a day for a constitutional. Cork peered into the slit between the wool muffler that came above the nose and the knitted cap that was pulled down to the eyebrows. The mittens were drawn off, and Cork saw old veined hands stained with liver spots. The hands went to the muffler, whose ends were tucked securely inside the collar of the coat. As the muffler came loose, Cork recognized Henry Malou, whom the white people around Aurora sometimes called Mad Mel. Cork knew he was, in fact, one of the Medawiwin, an Anishinaabe medicine man, who lived by himself on a remote point around the northwest end of the lake. He must have been walking most of the day in the blizzard to have come so near town. Shoot, Henry, what could be so important it would bring you out on a day like this? Malou stared beyond the wipers that shoved the snow into little heaps off to the sides of the windshield. Snow, not snow, the day is the same to me. Noble philosophy, Henry, but one that could get you frozen to death. I've seen more storms than you could imagine, and worse, I've seen storms and other things. Cork reached inside his parka for his pack of lucky strikes. Cigarette, Henry? The old man took one, so did Cork. But before Cork could light up, the old man sniffed at the air inside the Bronco. He gave Cork a grin full of teeth, remarkably good in a man so ancient. You smell like the good deep part of a woman. I think that wind's frozen your nose, Henry, Cork told him. No, the old man kept on grinning at him. It is a good day for a man to be inside. Baloo laughed softly. Understand? So we got a little risque there toward the end, but we uh, we get a, a sense of Malou's sense of humor. And uh, I have to tell you, when he walked into the series out of that snowstorm, I had no idea that he was going to do that. I had no idea who this guy was when I when I um, uh, wrote that scene. Walk on the magic. Yeah, that's that is part of the magic of being a storyteller. I had no idea the part he was going to ultimately play in the series. I mean, um, Henry the Malou is the favorite character of so many of my readers, and I have to admit, I look forward and tremendously to writing the scenes in which Henry plays a part, because I don't have to revise those scenes. Whatever Henry says is exactly what Henry ought to say. And you just said the right word, magic. There's so much about storytelling that feels like magic. Yeah, that's so true. So the reason I wanted to read that section is that uh, it introduces Henry Malou uh, 19 books ago. Uh, 
And he has, he has developed over the series and uh, so often occupies center stage along with Cork. Now, for those of you readers out there who have good memories, you may remember that last year I published a book in the Cork O'Connor series, a book called Lightning Strike, that was a prequel to the series. It takes place in the 1960s and deals with Cork as an adolescent. The year before that, no book came out because it was the pandemic and publishers were really reluctant to put uh, books they thought might be big out at that point in time. The year before that, um, This Tender Land came out. And the year before that, all ancient history almost, the last contemporary Cork O'Connor book came out, a book called Desolation Mountain. Now, at the end of that book, I left Henry Malou in a really precarious situation. Both Henry, uh, who has visions, and Cork's son, Stephen, who has visions, have seen, they both have had a vision of Henry Malou's death. That's where I left the book. Now, across the course of the last three years, I've had a lot of time to think about, well, what the hell do I do with that? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and Fox Creek answers the question of what happens to Henry Malou. Okay, and you're not going to tell us, obviously. I will not, but I will give you sort of the down and dirty on the on the story. Um, a woman, a stranger, comes to Crow Point seeking the help of Henry and his great niece Rainy, Cork's wife. She's followed there by ruthless mercenaries who believe she has information that important people are desperate to possess. Um, Henry Malou, in what may be the last journey he takes into the wilderness, this beloved wilderness he is, that has been his home for a hundred years, he guides Rainey and this stranger into the wilderness um, seeking safety, using all of his wiles to try to stay ahead of these deadly trackers. Uh, Cork, of course, is doing his best to, to follow, but uh, nature throws everything it can at Cork, and in the dark night of his soul, Cork is deathly afraid that there is nothing he can do to save the people he loves. Wow. Okay. Well, we'll be going out in a week to buy that book. <laughs> That's great. Okay. Well, let's take um, some of these um, questions. I... I've been kind of looking at them, but um, what do what do the people in the real Aurora think about the fictional Aurora? <laughs> I have a number of people have asked that. Yeah, here's a good story. So after Iron Lake came out, I got an email that went something like this. Dear Mr. Kruger, greetings from the real Aurora. It came from the librarians at the Aurora Library. And, uh, and they said, uh, we have got your book and we think you've done a pretty good job. Uh, I had a chance and not long after that to go up to Aurora and, and uh, meet the librarians. And at one point the head librarian took me into the stacks and she pulled Iron Lake off the shelf. And she said, you know, when any of our patrons come in and they don't know uh, what they wanna read, we recommend your book. She said, they, whenever they come back though, they always say, we wanna live in this Aurora. <laughs> <laughs> I got that. Okay, here's one, and I don't know, this is this is kind of a complex question, I think. Um, but I think it's an interesting question. If you were to write the Cork O'Connor books now, starting now, uh, instead of starting in the 1990s, uh, would you do anything differently? I'm not sure I can really answer that question. Yeah, I know. It's a hard what they are. The stories come out of a particular time and a particular place, and, uh, you know, sans technology, no cell phones, no, which is really very helpful when you're trying to isolate somebody. In the wilderness. Um, so I, I don't, you know, I, maybe this is a little off topic, but maybe we get to the, to the heart of it. Uh, many years ago, my backlist was going to be uh, reissued as mass mark as in, they were all in mass market and they were going to come out in trade, you know, 
mass market are the small ones. Paperbacks used to actually fit in your pocket. The trade are much larger, uh, much nicer covers, a little more expensive. And I thought, you know, I would read all of my backlist and blog about all of the things that I would do differently now that I had experience as a writer, was deep into the series. And I got to tell you, Pat, I, or Ellen, I read... Uh, <laughs> All right. I, I answered a lot of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know you under a couple of different names. Yes. Um, and I, I got to tell you, after reading all of those books, my main thought was, well, this guy's pretty good. I, I didn't see a single, single thing that I would change okay. that I thought I could do better at that point. Okay. Well, that's wonderful. Um, I wish I could say the same. <laughs> um, um, there are people who are commenting that they saw the Minnesota crime wave, which is fun. There are a number of people who want to know who your favorite authors are. Can you want to speak to that a little bit? Sure. I less rather than favorite authors, I have favorite books. Oh, okay. But I do, I, I will say, I do have a recently have a favorite, kind of a favorite author, a guy named Frederick Bachman. Uh, most uh, of you folks out there may know him as the author of A Man Called Ove. He oh. is a Scandinavian author, and uh, I've read every one of his books. I look forward to them coming out because he is uh, he's so compassionate in, his, uh, in the way he approaches his characters. Uh, I just love the heart in his books, and he's just a fine writer. So Frederick Bachman is really one of my favorites these days. But rather than favorite authors, typically I have favorite books, and, uh, and probably everybody out there does. Uh, to Kill a Mockingbird is my all-time favorite book, and I reread that about every other year. I love uh, Catcher in the Rye. Uh, you know, I love Minnesota Zones, F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby. Um, so, the, I, you know, I try to go back to the classics uh, when I'm looking for something to reread M my favorite books. But, you know, in the mystery genre, I can say I have some favorite authors in the genre. I love James, the work of James Lee Burke, who writes the uh, uh, Dave Robichaux series. I love Michael Connolly's work. I love Dennis Lehane's work. Uh, I love the work of uh, Margaret Cole, um, uh, Louise Penny out of Canada. I, I love all of those writers' works. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a number of people have asked about your tour destinations. Can you speak to that a little bit or where they could find out that information? Sure, they can find the, the tour schedule for uh, the Fox Creek tour. Mm -hmm. You can find on my website, www.williamkentkruger.com. Uh, and uh, I have uh, limited myself to the almost entirely the upper Midwest because I hate flying these days. And I'm simply not going to fly all the way across the country Cross, crisscross the country on airplanes for this this particular novel. So I'm upper Midwest. I'm uh, lots of places, lots of uh, small bookstores and in independents in Minnesota, um, in uh, North and uh, North Dakota, Iowa, Wisconsin, Kansas, Nebraska, Illinois. Um, yeah, I have a, about a forty event tour. Oh scheduled. my gosh! So are you going to be on the road for a long, long time without coming back or you go back and forth? It's mostly back and forth. I actually only have one week where I'm going to actually be on the road. And I swing down to Nebraska and Kansas and Iowa and Illinois. And will and Diane go with you? And Diane will be with me. Diane okay. is my wife, folks. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's fun then. That, that'll be fun. Um, someone would like to know if you have a favorite of your books. Yeah, I do. I have four favorites in the Cork O'Connor series um, and uh, the two standalones, uh, Ordinary Grace and This Tenderland. I have to say this, honestly, Ordinary Grace and This Tenderland are probably my favorite novels that I've written. Um, you know this, Pat, a mystery is an intellectual construct. Mm -hmm. You are putting the pieces together consciously in a way to make sure every, all the corners fit. Um, and it comes in large measure from your head. Ordinary Grace in This Tenderland came from my heart. They came from an entirely different place and I used an entirely different process to write those stories. So those are probably my two favorite. But in terms of the Cork O'Connor series, of course, Iron Lake is one of my favorites. It was my first child and it, it you know, just launched me into this sure, genre sure. that I love. Um, so uh, Iron Lake, I love uh, a book about six 
uh, novels after that called Thunder Bay because it's Henry Malou's story. It's how Henry Malou became the, this wise uh, person that he is. Um, I love a book called Sulphur Springs. It's one of the books that I've written and took Cork outside Minnesota. I put him in Southern Arizona because I wanted to talk about the issue of the refugees coming across our Southern border. Um, and and I love um, I loved Lightning Strike. I just loved revisiting visiting Cork as an adolescent. That was such a fun book to write. Okay, great. Which when we talked on the phone the other day, I had not. I mean, our processes used to be so different. And this is maybe we talk about process for a minute. Uh, how how writers write their books. Um, I think one of the first things that a writer does is to figure out what their process is. Yeah. And your process and my process are extremely different. You have you have always the cork books, you have always outlined significantly before you begin writing. But you said to me something interesting that the two standalones, recent standalones, you did not write that way. Yeah. And so why the difference? Again, it's it's because of the kind of story that I wanted to tell and the place where th that the story came from. I wanted the reader to, I wanted it to be an organic process. You know, when I write my Cork O'Connor series, I think the story through as completely as I can before I ever put my, my fingers to the keyboard. At the end of that long thinking process, I know how the story begins. I know how it ends. I know who did what to whom and why. I know the themes that I want to weave through the story. But I wanted, particularly with Ordinary Grace first and then this tender land, I wanted the story to feel different. I wanted the reader to feel like I was telling them this story from my heart. And so I only knew a few salient uh, elements that were gonna be involved in the stories when I went into the writing of them. And I let the story reveal itself to me, which is much the process you have always followed. And I gotta tell you, uh, Ellen, it was one of the most, the writing of those two books are the, the most satisfying creative process I, I have ever had as a writer. Um, I, I, with Ordinary Grace particularly, I felt like I was being given this story. Honestly, it was one of the easiest books I have ever written. I, I, you know, I think that's, I think that's extremely interesting th that you changed your process sort of midstream. There aren't, I think, a lot of writers who've probably done that. That is what I like about writing the way I write, which is mm -hmm. I come to the story very much the way the reader comes to the story. And I don't necessarily know what's going to happen, but the process of of letting that happen sort of organically watching the, the the characters seeing how they are behaving um how they're growing how they're changing within the story it sort of tells you where you're going to go you know and you love the revision process i know that i'm not real fond of revision so i work very hard to get that first draft as, as okay. good as i can possibly get it sure sure i get that um well, let's see. Um, do you have any more standalones planned? Funny you should ask. Yes. <laughs> I have just finished the revisions to the next standalone novel. It'll be out a year from this fall. It's called The River We Remember. Like Ordinary Grace and like this tender land, it's set in southern Minnesota. Uh, in an earlier time, it's set in uh, the summer of 1958, um, and um, and deals with um, a, a theme that was that has been important to me all my life. And I f I I finally figured out how to tell this story. It took really? me long. I I set aside this manuscript. Uh, you know, this manus this manuscript was originally purchased by my publisher, uh, like seven years ago wow. uh, and uh and i wrote the manuscript and i told my publisher when it was finished i don't want you to publish this because it's not the story i thought it would be i don't know how to make it that story um and my heart wasn't in it then during the pandemic because i had a lot of time and i'm older now and a better storyteller maybe i thought i know how to tell this story now and i went back and i rewrote it and i just love this this story it's called the river we remember it'll be out next fall oh that's cool that is so cool um we're kind of coming towards the end uh and i still have a question that i want to ask you one of my <laughs> um anything pat you can ask me anything can anything anything at all i'd like to know i'd like to know what surprised you 
both negatively and positively about the writing life? Well, what surprised me about the writing life is that not only can you make a living at it, you can make a really good living. Well, you have, yeah. <laughs> yes. Not everybody, and, but yeah. And I was um, surprised and just and tremendously pleased to discover um, the generosity of the community that I became a part of when I published a mystery. The mystery community is one of the most generous, supportive communities you can possibly imagine. And you know this. Um, so that uh, just surprised me tremendously in a, in a very pleasant way. And what was the other part of the question? Well, what, what surprised you both negatively and positively? Okay, so that was all of that was positive. Negatively, every the first cold splash of reality a published author gets is the realization that he or she is going to be responsible for getting that book into readers' hands. Yeah. Publishers really in the very beginning don't do a lot to help uh, promote your work. And so if you're gonna if you're gonna get the word out there, it's on your shoulders. So you have to create a website and, uh, and do social media and put together all your publicity materials. It's just an enormous amount of work. Um, and they don't tell you that um, uh, you know up front. No, I never I, heard F. Scott Fitzgerald say much about that. No, I mean, I think not every writer rises to the level of the New York Times bestseller list. You have, which is I, I've always thought it's it shows that the cream does rise. <laughs> Thank um, you. But I can still I can still see you standing next to the fireplace in our old house. You had just come from I think it was a Barnes and Noble where they had your book your new book, it was like, it was the only thing in one entire, uh, uh, you know, looking at it from the outside through the glass, it was, it was nothing but your book. And I mean, and people, and, and you were saying, I don't have a dime, you know, I mean, I'm not making much money. I think, I think it's all a process. And I think you just put your nose to the grindstone and you did what you could control, which was writing great books and traveling and doing the promotion. I think you've done it all right. I really do. You know, the, the, the one piece of advice I, I always offer young writers is this, um, write because you love it. First and foremost, write because you love it. Because the truth is um, almost none of us get rich and famous through our work. But if you're writing because you love it, then you're gonna spend your life following your heart. And what could be exactly. better? Exactly. That's so true. Um, I I can take one more question. Uh, Here comes Elaine. I see Elaine has popped on the screen. Has Elaine popped on? Hi, Elaine. <laughs> well, I, I will say hello then. I was going to wait for that, that final question, but it also had seemed like such a, a wonderful note to end on that I yes. thought I'd better be prepared. Um, is yes. there anything, well, I'll throw mine in then. Is there anything else that you wanted to share with our with our audience today, Ken? Yes, I want to share. I want to offer a thank you to the friends of the St. Paul Library for this kind of programming, which goes all all the way across our state, and is one of the important ways that we come together and we feel connected. So, thank you, friends of the St. Paul Public Library. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I was I was having a wonderful time listening to you both talk, and and I think I said when we first gathered that it felt very nostalgic for me because some of my earliest programs uh, with the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library were with the Minnesota Crime Wave, and yeah. so it was it was really really wonderful to to see to see you both together again. So thank you both so so much. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, we have uh, Iron Lake available through eBooks Minnesota through uh, Labor Day weekend. So the last reading day is the Sunday of Labor Day weekend. And so please check that out. The link has just been put in the chat. We'll also be following up with everyone who registered for the event. There'll be a brief questionnaire. We really want to hear about how you've engaged with this program and your thoughts. And so we'll include a link to the recording of today's program, as well as the, the link to that um, to the download of both the ebook and the audiobook in case you haven't read Iron Lake yet um, or would like to reread it yet, yet again. So all of that will be coming to you all through email. 
Um, I just, I think that as always, I leave these, these programs with so much appreciation for the amazing writers we have in, in our state and also our incredibly thoughtful readers. So I think that, that neither could really exist without the other and we're just tremendously fortunate to be in Minnesota. So thank you again to everyone for joining us tonight for One Book in Minnesota. Thank you, Kent. Thank you, Ellen. And good night.